Hey everyone, it's been a while, so welcome back to a new map video. Today we have a traveler's map of the British Isles from the National Geographic Society, from the magazine. And this one is from April 1974. So this is actually older than me. And it was kindly sent in by Timon, who added this lovely um, postcard of Switzerland. I really like this picture here with the cows, I guess, coming down from the mountain with a little decorative hat and Timon writes that this was something he won in elementary school one of his teachers liked to play bingo with his pupils and the winner got to choose something from a box of different kinds of memorabilia including maps time and wonders. Kept it for a couple years and eventually decided to gift it to me, which I really appreciate. Thank you so much. I really like these maps from the National Geographic magazine just because there is so much to explore here, so much information that they put in such little space. It's a bit too much to explore in one video, so we are going to pick out some parts. We have recently looked at a map of Scotland, so let's turn this over. We have here Ireland and Northern Ireland, the Isle of Man, here's Wales, and the part that I would like to have a look at is England. And kind of explore the different areas of it. It's something I've had to learn um, in school, but it's been a while, and there are some bits and pieces that I, where I kind of know the names, but I've had some issue with figuring out where they fit on the map or when they fit. And I always figured looking at the regions maybe would help, but as you can see here, it's difficult to really find any regions. But obviously this part I know is Cornwall. But I can't find this on the map. We have the national parks in Dartmoor and um, Exmoor, which I think I've just seen over here. We have, of course, the different place names like Plymouth or St. Austell, Truro. We have small infos here, like this place being called Mouse Hall, just here. We have historic sites. Oh, let's get my little pointer. All these little figures here and symbols. And all of this little information, like here, hikers now enjoy the exhilaration of Cliff and Cove along the 135 mile North Cornwall and 133 mile South Cornwall paths. 
central links in a projected 515 miles southwest peninsula path to and from Minehead in Somerset to Stutland in Dorset. So I know that Somerset and Dorset are two different regions, but again, can't find them here. Before we continue, I also want to briefly read this part here. There's a motorway, and it explains Fighting to the death against cars that cross its ancestral paths, the Badger has won a Badger underpass from Badger motorway builders. It is such a weird choice of language, but I guess that's what makes this really exciting. Fighting to the death on its ancestral paths. So we do have some bits of text that look like they could be um, regions like here, South Downs and North Downs, but I don't think they are, unless that's an older expression. There's East Anglia here. The Yorkshire Dales, North York Moors National Park. So all in all, lots of info, but I figured it's a bit difficult to kind of put some order to this and figure out where you are. So I looked up some um, some different maps on the regions of England. It took me a while to figure out how it works because of course you have historic kingdoms, you have uh, counties that sometimes go back really far, but then you have administrative readjustments and restructurings and the way it works now is that there are nine regions that have very dry names like northeast and northwest and east of England. So they really just describe where something is. Um, but kind of these historic names are a bit more difficult to um, to put into a short video, let's put it that way. And without learning all the different counties, which is a bit more than I can manage for a video. But I figured let's go through it. We'll start in the north and work our way down. So we begin here in the very north on the border to Scotland. And you can see here that we have Adrian's Wall in there. Going all the way across from east to west. That's 73 miles or 117 kilometers. At the time, it was exactly 80 Roman miles. It roughly coincides with the border to Scotland, of course you can see here. It's a little bit further south. And all the way up here in Bamberg, says, from here, Saxon kings ruled lands north of the river Humber, Northumbria. And there's a restored 12th century castle that rises sheer from a basalt crack. The Humber is right here. 
Now we have Kingston upon Hull. And this area then already is in Yorkshire. So we have the Northumberland National Park all the way to the north. Northumbria, referring to north of the Humber, was an old Anglo-Saxon kingdom. But you have lots of different regional identities. And of course, when we talk about an Anglo-Saxon kingdom, that was in the Middle Ages, and there's lots of different things that have happened since then. But some of these old names have persisted. Here in the northeast, the name Northumbria is still present in Northumberland. Then we have a region called Tyne and Ware. The Tyne is a river that we can also find in the name, for example, Newcastle upon Tyne and Thester. I also read that here in this region around Newcastle, this is where there's a specific accent being spoken called Geordie, and apparently Geordie has been voted as one of the most attractive and most loved accents in England. I did tell a friend about this who's from England and he was outraged to say the least, so I guess that's it. A bit of a subjective thing. <laughs> so not everyone loves the Geordie accent, but a lot of people do. So we have the northeast here. There's one other thing that's worth pointing out. Let's see if we can find it. Almost missed it. Right here, there's something called a holy island. And that's where you find Lindisfarne. Lindisfarne is known for two things, basically. One is the Lindisfarne Gospel, which is a manuscript from the 8th century. And there's also a copy in Old English from the 10th century and it has these really beautiful illustrations in the manuscript. The other thing that Lindisfarne is known for, however, is that this is where the Vikings first came to England in 793. And it sent shockwaves throughout the entire region. They plundered the monastery and were known for their brutality afterwards. And speaking of Vikings, when we go a bit further down here in Yorkshire, we can see that there's something called the Yorkshire Dales. Dale is something that's typical for this northern region, a term that is sort of regional and you, you don't necessarily find in the south or in the kind of standard English that you learn in school. It's very closely related to a German word, Tal, it means valley, and it comes from the language of the Vikings, who brought it here. With their language, which was Old Norse. And that's something you find in the entire region. Here, this area is called the Pennines. They're not really mountains, they're more elevations, they're less than 900 meters or 3,000 feet tall. But they're often called fells, 
which also comes from an old Norse word. In Norwegian, a mountain is called a fjell, so that's almost the same thing. Or you might have heard people call children barn. That too is a Scandinavian word. One of the reasons you find so many Old Norse words here in the north is that the Vikings didn't just come to plunder, they actually came and settled down after a while. And that was here in Yorkshire. We have Leeds here. Um, here we have York, which was the main city. The old name for this region was Jorvik, and it was its own Viking kingdom. So the land actually belonged to the Vikings. And you still find a lot of words in the language, and of course also in the accent, which is um, quite distinct. Lots of places here in the north have a distinct accent, and the Yorkshire one is among them. It's also one of the regions with a distinct identity, which you don't find everywhere. Today the area is called Yorkshire and the Humber. So it extends a little bit across the Humber, which by the way, it's often called a river, but this is more brackish water, so meaning the salt water comes in from the sea and you might have a tide, so it's not a freshwater river. If we cross the Pennines and we go to the western part, come to a region simply called the Northwest. Again, not particularly creative, but also a region with a very long history. In the very north, this area is called Cumbria. That's also where you find the highest point in the Pennines. Um, I think it might actually be this one here, Crossfell, 2930 feet. So there's an example of the fell that I mentioned. And we have the Lake District here, which is said to be very, very beautiful. And here we see the Cumbrian Mountains. And if you think this looks a bit familiar, because after all, here in Wales, we also have Cumbrian Mountains. They're just spelled a little differently, with an A instead of a U. Then you're right, this is related, at least linguistically. When the Anglo-Saxons came, you did have an old Celtic population here that persisted and spoke its own language called Cumbrian. It probably existed until the 12th, 13th century, and by that time it died out. When we go a bit further south, we have places like Liverpool and Manchester. Liverpool also has a really distinct accent called Scouse, which is influenced by Gaelic from Wales and Ireland, but also from a lot of Scandinavian sailors who came here. Not back with the Vikings, but later in the 19th century. The Scouse accent is actually quite new. And before it sounded more like the 
surrounding areas, which is Lancashire. You have the Mercy here, so the area is also called Merseyside. Then, of course, there's Manchester. It says here there's a canal 35 meters long, which brings the world's ships to Manchester for cottons and computers. Manchester was one of the centers of the Industrial Revolution, especially when it comes to anything to do with the textile industry. And I think it wasn't a particularly nice place to be for most of that time. It's actually where Friedrich Engels wrote one of his books, Conditioning of the Working Class, which had a huge influence on Karl Marx. So, tells you something about the living standards. And as for Liverpool, we also have a little info here. It says it was the gateway to America for thousands of immigrants and was home port of the Titanic and the Lusitania. And of course, home of the Beatles. And like I said, this entire region is roughly called the North. There is no exact line here in the south. You don't have a Hadrian's Wall or a this border like you do to Scotland. So, depending on who you ask, someone from the north is going to pull the border a bit further towards them. If you ask someone in the south, they're going to say the north starts like, I don't know, somewhere down here, I guess. But it's roughly in this area. Some people will include Cheshire, some won't. So that's a bit of a subjective thing. When we move south of the Humber, basically, we come to an area simply called the Midlands. Today, these are two fisher regions, the East Midlands and the West Midlands. And historically, this was an Anglo-Saxon kingdom called Mercia, which you might have heard of in the early Middle Ages. You had lots of Anglo-Saxon kingdoms here in the south. Uh, East Anglia was one of them, which we have here. And then places like Wessex, Sussex, Kent. So they would all be here a bit further south, but again, unfortunately, I can't see them written down on this map. But before we move here, let's stay in the Midlands for a moment. The largest city in the Midlands is Birmingham. It's sometimes called the second city of the UK because this entire region here up to Wolverhampton is basically one large area, a conurbation it's called which is not a word I'd heard before. It's not far to London, about 160 kilometers. And you maybe know Birmingham because it was home to G.R.R. Tolkien, who based some of his descriptions of Middle Earth on the areas around here in the Midlands. And of course, 
guys, we have lots of history here. We have feathers fancifully caved Tudor in here. There's a historic port, world famed for sauce and porcelain in Worcester, for the Worcestershire sauce. Here we also have Isaac Newton's home. We have some gruesome history too, like Mary Queen of Scots was beheaded here in 1587. But then here there's a tulip festival in May. So, Mercia existed in the early Middle Ages. And we already said we had a Viking kingdom up here in Yorkshire. And then we also had a period in the Middle Ages when the Vikings ruled here in this area. And that was called the Dane law because they applied their Danish laws. There were five boroughs. Let's see if we can find the places. One of them was Leicester, Derby, Lincoln, then we have Nottingham, which of course is very well known, and the last one is Stanford, which should also be here. There's a Stafford, but that's not it. find it another time. And again, of course, you find traces of the Danes in names such as Grimsby, where the B at the end basically means city. I don't know if it means city at the time. But today, a B in Norwegian would be just that. All right, if we come further down, south of the Danelaw, south of Birmingham, we then have three more regions. That's the southwest. The southeast and the east of England, plus of course Greater London, so technically four. We've talked about London before, so I think we're going to skip that today. If we come to the southwest, we again have Celtic history right here in. Cornwall, which is a popular tourist destination today. The Cornish language unfortunately died out in the 19th century, but there are attempts to revive it today, which I think is a great thing. And part of Cornwall is also the Isle of Scilly. With, again, a strange text here. We pray thee, O Lord, not that Rex should happen, but that if any happen, that will guide them into the silly isle for the benefit of the inhabitants. Seeing figureheads from Rex that adorn subtropical Trescovavi gardens, visitors by motorship or helicopter from Pensane might think the 18th century prayer answered. Now locals prosper by putting early flowers in London vases. I might just lack some context here. 
I don't know what the London Bells would refer to in the early flowers, but to think that people were praying for some wreck so that they could benefit from the the poor <laughs> the poor people falling into the sea it seems a bit odd. So we then get to Devon, where we've already mentioned the two moors, the Dartmoor National Park and the Exmoor National Park. Again, places I mostly know because there are wild ponies here. We have the famous on the path for the Patchers. We have a cottage right here, where Covage wrote the ancient mariner. We have a place called Cheddar, where the cheese of the same name comes from. We have two places, or two regions, called Dorset and Somerset. Somerset is also where you find the city of Bath, which someone recommended a while ago in the comments. It's a very beautiful place. It's right here. There we go. The entire center is a World Heritage Site. Of course, there's also Bristol. And then there's also Gloucester, with the famous cathedral. Let's see if we can find it. Right here. And I hope I'm remembering this correctly. I think Gloucester Cathedral also appeared in the Harry Potter movies. Which, by the way, would you believe it? I saw for the first time, mm, I think like six, seven years ago, they were on TV and I actually sat down to watch them and I loved them, but somehow when the books came out I was just in, just the, at the wrong age and I thought they were a bit silly and for, ch for children. Okay, but let's stick with this map. Then there's also a place called Wiltshire, and that's where you find Stonehenge, right here. So that's quite far in the south. So Druids mark the summer solstice with rites. I don't know why they put this in uh, quotation marks and in the present. Maybe there's some funny Druids around there in the 1970s. And apparently here in Starhead, there's the finest landscape garden in England. And of course, something that always fascinates me, a magnificent priory church dating from the 11th century. If we jump to the other side, where we see East Anglia, we are in the east of England. And the Anglia, of course, refers to the Anglo-Saxons. It's actually a place in the very, very north of Germany, close to the border to Denmark, that is called Anglia or Anglian, which is where the Angles came from. It's in the Baltic Sea today. The two regions here are called Norfolk and Suffolk. And that just comes from the Northern Folk and the Southern Folk. Just like when we talk about Essex, Wessex, Sussex, that all refers to the 
Western Saxons, the Eastern Saxons, and the Southern Saxons. There was also a place called Middlesex, but that's pretty much London today. We have Cambridge here in this area. There's also Luton, which is a famous school, but I'm not sure where that's located here. But as you can imagine, as you get closer to London, you also get more affluent areas. Whereas the north you have um, a lot of changes with the Industrial Revolution, but it suffered a bit economically since. And here you have lots of places you might identify with. Um, maybe the Royals, there's also Wimbledon, for example. Over oh, here, we're getting away from the east of England. There's also Oxford here, so sometimes Oxford and Cambridge are put together as Oxbridge, meaning the two famous universities where a lot of people go to. And then the smaller region around London, these counties are sometimes called home country, so that would include Kent, Surrey and Hertfordshire together with Essex. Also a fascinating piece of info, Pocahontas is buried here, which is something I didn't know. And you have Winchester here which is, or which was the capital of England before London. A famous place also, Hastings, 1066, where the Normans came to England from the south. Here it says William of Normandy, landing unopposed as Pevensey, defeated Harold, last Saxon king of England, and hold off the side of his conquest of Battle Abbey. And as for Winchester, it tells us it was Alfred the Great's capital, with longest medieval cathedral, shrine of Saxon and Danish kings. Winchester College, where manners make of men, founded. 1382, England's first public school, and the round table of King Arthur, the Great Castle's Great Hall. So King Arthur is also a story that is set in the south. I don't know if it's set here in this region. I think it's more of a Celtic story. But of course, at the time, the um, populations were moving, the borders were moving, and that we have the border between Cornwall and Devons here today. That's of course also not something that was always the case. And then of course, we have so many other bits and pieces like this Roman mosaic floors right here. There's the Isle of Wight. There's Portsmouth, which was Britain's chief naval base, and it enshrines Nelson's victory. And so on, and so on. The world's longest pleasure pier, which attracts millions of visitors each year in South End and Sea. There's a Dickens Festival in June. A 
splendours of its cathedral and thirty-three medieval churches bespeak days when Norwich, prospering a centre of the Worcester trade, stood second in size to Tudor London. You can visit an old water mill which is now a youth hostel. Of a bold new cathedral in Coventry, which symbolizes the city's post war rebirth. Of course, in 1974, that wasn't all that long ago. Not even 20 years. If we briefly turn this around. So see, there's lots and lots of info here in the back, and we have all these different regions that I mentioned, like Northumberland, Tyne and Ware, Durham, there's Cleveland too, Cumbria, Lancashire, Merseyside, Greater Manchester, there's North Yorkshire, and Humberside. And uh, with Yorkshire, actually, the interesting part is that it was divided into different regions under the Vikings, and these were called ridings, which is something you still find, like the East Riding, just means a third, basically. We have Cheshire here, counter with the Midlands. I saw it countered with the North Country. I don't think I saw a place called Sala when I was reading up on it. But that's just nominations changing a bit. I thought it was really interesting though to kind of figure out where things are with regards to one another. Oftentimes I just heard the names but wasn't sure where to place them. frankly particularly an issue um, back when I was often with some friends from England who watched a lot of football and I would hear things like Wolverhampton and Merseyside and you know all those places and I just had no clue where they were all from I think for today, that's enough. And just as a final remark, I know a lot of you have asked for a video on Ireland. I'll just have to figure out how to pronounce all the different places first. I'm a bit scared of the Irish language. Well, let's say I have a lot of respect. So, I'll keep this for another time. For today, thank you so much for watching. And I will see you again soon. Good night.